Hello everyone, I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. This week we're talking to Kevin Maurer. Now, Kevin wrote the book that people all around the world wanted to read about the Navy SEALs raid that killed Osama bin Laden. But long before that book came out, Kevin was a reporter for the Fayetteville Observer, for the Associated Press in North Carolina, and then for the Wilmington Star News. Still works for that paper today. He's covered county commission meetings and city council meetings. He's written about Gen X. He's written about tainted water at Camp Lejeune. But he's also reported more than a dozen times as an embedded reporter with the military in Iraq and Afghanistan. Kevin's hard work earned him a reputation. And when it came time for that former Navy SEAL Mark Owen to tell the story of the raid, he picked Kevin Maurer to do it. No Easy Day is the name of the book. It became a number one bestseller. But it started a controversy that ended with Mark Owen having to pay the government millions of dollars. Kevin Maurer is back with another book. It's the story of an undercover Muslim FBI agent who infiltrated an al-Qaeda plot to attack the United States. During our interview, I found out that Kevin Maurer really didn't start out to be a reporter. I've never taken a, a journalism class or a writing class ever. I, it's just curiosity. It, it allowed me to go to places that I couldn't get to otherwise. Um, so I was, at DC, I was in D.C. and I met my, my wife. At, well, she was my girlfriend at the time. She moved to Boston. And when I moved to Boston, I got in with a media company that did databases for mm -hmm. public relations people. And a lot of guys there were writing. And I figured I had a whole database of editors. So I just started sending out pitches to people. And slowly I built a little bit of a freelance job, mostly just learning it you know, by watching. And then I realized it was something I wanted to do. And I went back to D.C. With it to get a staff job, cover NOSHA. Yeah. So now you um, what did you want to do growing up? Where did you grow up? I, didn't you grow up in D.C.? Where'd I grew you... up a little bit in D.C. I spent four years in Paris. My dad was uh, the assistant attache for customs in Paris. And then I moved back to Virginia Beach. So about to eight years in Virginia Beach, including college. So what did you want to do? I mean, what did, when you when you went to school to study political science, what was the what was then the world going to be like for Kevin Maurer? I just wanted to get out of college. I'll be honest, I was lazy. I was a terrible student. And political science, I was the least studying I had to do. I just, it just, I could get it without really working on it. So there really wasn't a lot of planning mm -hmm. in your future at mm -hmm. that point in time? I did two years of Naval ROTC, and I went to the Balk, uh, the Balk, Baltic. It was okay. a Baltic sea cruise, and I went to Northern Ireland, and I went to Scotland, and I went to Norway, and I went to Murmansk, Russia. Okay. It was phenomenal. Really cool trip. The port calls were great. Loved that part. Um... Hated living on the ship and wanted to really move on to a ship like an oiler who had big staterooms or an amphibious ship with big staterooms because I was, was going to be an officer. And I just didn't want to live better than in this small bunk in this, in this passageway, which is where we were living before. Right. And I realized I don't have the warrior ethos that they're looking for. So I quit when I got back. And on my last fitness report that they write about you, they said, this guy should never be in the other military. He has no military bearing and he's unfit for military <laughs> service. And then... What about eight years later, six six years later? You know, I'm up. I'm on the Iraq invasion, so yeah, it's sort of fun that, <laughs> that, that it worked out. Did you look that so. guy back up again who wrote that on the on the report? No, but I, I would say, it, in his defense, he was absolutely right. At the time, I was not fit for any of it. So, so, so you you moved to Boston, and and what kind of you said you pitched some things. What kind of mm. things did you pitch? Ideas for stories? What did anything you... I could think of. Uh, a lot of band stuff because we had a pretty good music was coming through there, and I, I liked getting free CDs so <laughs> and free concert tickets. And then I, I, I wrote a story about a chair for Details Magazine at the time. Um, stuff like wow. that. Anything I could write, I would write. Uh, I wrote, did a bunch of local stories for a paper in Dorchester. Anything that would let me write. What um, was the name of the paper? The Dorchester Reporter, I think it is. Really? Yeah. Wrote two stories for them. Awful. I, I and I did. You still have them? No, but I know exactly what I was trying to do, and I had the right idea. I just mm -hmm. didn't know how to do it. So curiosity is more of what got got you into this than a desire to tell a story early on. Absolutely. It, 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 I had a commitment thing where I just I didn't. The Navy was fun. I liked the fun stuff, but I didn't want to commit to it. Mm -hmm. So being a reporter allowed me to sort of dabble in everybody else's life without actually committing to. All right, here's your path. This is where you're going. Okay, so you come back to D.C. after time in Boston, mm -hmm. and you're working for OSHA, you said? No, I was working for a newsletter publisher covering OSHA. Oh, okay. uh, we got there in August of 2001. We're uh, living in uh, Alexandria. Uh, September 11, 2001 hits. We're right there at the Pentagon. The office was, what, a block and a half from the Pentagon? So I watched this thing unfold, and I think from that point I knew 
if you're going to be a reporter, that's the story you got to go tell. So that day, what do you remember mm. about that day? Just the confusion. I mean, it, no one knew what was going on. We were getting conflicting reports about how there was attack on the Capitol. There was car bombs on the mall. Um, we all got out of work early. Uh, we weren't sure if the metro was running. Uh, you could see bits of the Pentagon floating in the sky. You could see the smoke. My wife was on 395 going home right when it hit. So, I mean, we were all, you know, cell phones weren't everywhere then. So you, you really didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, I remember going on the metro and we went, the metro r the ride back used to take me past National Airport and it was completely deserted on all the planes were, were grounded. And that was eerie. And when I got out of the metro, there was F-15s, I think, flying over DC, mm -hmm. maybe yeah. F-16s, I don't remember exactly. And uh, somebody was yelling, oh, it's the other plane, it's the other plane. So it was really tense, you right. know. And it, the sniper came a couple months later. I mean, it was a really tense time to be oh, in D.C. Yeah. Um, but I just remember thinking at that point, I've I got to get to Afghanistan. I've got to get to to into this story. This is the story that has to be. I want to help tell it. It's the biggest story that I can think of in my lifetime. So you're still not even a reporter at that time. You're doing a newsletter work mm -hmm. at that yeah. time. So your first actual reporting job was in Fayetteville. Right. Or uh, was that my mom? Well, as a newsletter reporter, I was still a reporter. And, okay, and so right, I learned right. a lot. But what's hard about it is you, it was a, there were 700 people got this newsletter. It was printed on blue paper and stapled. I mean, okay. this thing was low. But they were paying, I think, tons of money for this thing. And really what you were writing for was policy guys. Okay. So you had to know what you were writing about, which is one of the first lessons I learned is you can't fake it. you got to know oh, yeah. what you're writing about. Yeah. And they didn't want to know what happened before or what happened that day. They wanted to have know what was going to happen. So you had to gauge your reporting towards thinking about where people might be going with policy. So it, cha it taught me really how to report differently. You know, the, the daily news story I wasn't very good at, but I was good at looking at, it, at a policy or looking at something and saying, okay, where is it going and how mm -hmm. do we get to there? Right. Um, and that was sort of the fascinating training. And, and the guy, Bob Cusack, who runs The Hill right now, and this guy, Klaus Mare, were the two editors who basically taught me how to be reporters. And, and what, was spent, the name of the mag what was the name of the newsletter? Inside OSHA. Okay. It was from Inside Washington Pub Publishers. They yeah. do EPA. They do defense. They do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, um, so, so basically, you took a crash course in reporting. I mean, like uh, several years of college journalism training, you got in. How long were you there? Yeah, a year and a half. Yeah. They handed me a, 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 a cap. Capital, you know, congressional press pass, and they gave me the book with everybody's name in it, and they said, "Get to it." How did you get that job? After all, they'll take people. It's oh, it's really? A really a great training ground. I, I think even if you took journalism classes, if you really want a good crash course in DC reporting, mm -hmm. go go do it. it no one's going to read your stuff except policy guys, but you're going to leave there with a source network like you can't beat. Like mm -hmm. I had a source network for OSHA that was ridiculous. Sure. Um, and I knew every, I mean, I could listen to everybody's speeches and figure out if they changed a sentence or changed the nuance, I knew the policy was. I mean, I was so locked in on OSHA. It was really ridiculous. It's actually kind of sad. I know more about permissible exposure limits than you really should know if you don't work in that. that I'm thing. sure at some point in time in the next 15 or 16 years, you probably used a little bit of that stuff. A little right? bit. I mean, it's helped with some of this Gen X stuff. It's sure. helped a little bit with some of the, the Lejeune water stuff I've done. Yeah. Um, but what I, I mean, I broke a story about ergonomics at the time. I mean, it, when the war was going on, the fact that they weren't going to do an ergonomics rule yeah. was a big deal to OSHA. It was a big deal to anybody else. I did that. I did a, another story. It was really investigative stuff, so I did another story about how um, was it that they, they they said they weren't making any rules because everybody at OSHA was helping with the the nine eleven ground zero stuff, and I talked to a bunch of rule makers who said, "No, nah, we're not doing any of that," and that was a big story in that little world too. But sure. you know, you it was a good place to learn. It was a good place to make some mistakes, and I had really good editors who really took some bad hat well didn't i didn't have any bad habits but they could take some really raw writing and turn it into something good yeah so really a crash course again mm -hmm. so you, you you came down i guess fayetteville was your first actual writing for a newspaper right right in 2003 uh i saw a job open a military reporter job opened uh in fayetteville um and so i tailored my resume and my pitch letter as a the military is a federal agency and a federal beat and mm -hmm. i've been covering the federal government for a year and a half so yeah. i'd be perfect i know how to do it sure i had a little military knowledge because of the rtc and my dad and my mom were both vietnam veterans so i knew a little bit and I, as a kid we liked the, all the military stuff so i had a little of this knowledge but i just oversold it and went down there 
and interview. Mm-hmm. How how did the whole process go? I went down and met with the the uh, managing editor, Mike Adams, who's no longer there. He used to be the executive editor. Yeah. He's gone now. And then uh, Henry Cunningham. I'm not sure if you knew. Yeah, I know Henry. the name. Yeah. yeah, we called him the Colonel. Yeah. Actually, he by now he by the time I got there, he's probably a general. But uh, <laughs> super good editor. We yeah. sat down and talked quite a bit. Um, and. They must have liked me. My first question to them was, why hasn't anybody internally you know, taken this job? Because this seems like a dream job. Well, yeah, a Fayetteville reporter, yeah. a military reporter. Wartime, sure. It's, it's, yeah. You got material every day. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I don't know. I don't know why they hired me. I, I, I'm grateful, but I'm not well, sure I mean, why Somebody they had to see something. And, and, and for those who, who don't remember, 2003, you get this. The invasion comes that year, mm-hmm. and this was the change of how media covered war. 700 some odd embedded reporters, and you know, you're one of them, right? Well, yeah, Tanya Bianc was the initial reporter. She went with the 2nd Brigade of the 82nd to Kuwait, and then she was there for a couple weeks, I think. Right. And then, but at the time she was dating the brigade intelligence officer, and they decided to get engaged right before the invasion. The army didn't really want to send them on a honeymoon to Iraq, right. so yeah. she left. They, they they asked her to come back, uh, and so Henry came to me. I had been there three months and said, "Hey, you want to go to Iraq?" All there right. you go. Yeah, I mean, what are you going to say? No, I mean, that's why sure. I took the job. So Steve Aber and I went over and we swapped with Tahanya and another photographer, and we got there on the last flight into Kuwait, and then the next day we went out to this resort on the Persian Gulf where they. They, this reservist guy says, hey, you look like about a large, and he handed me a chemical suit and a gas mask and said, when you hear the siren, put this stuff on it and run to the bunker. And that was it. And we went out to the 82nd, who, who were based at the airport at the time. And we and lived that there. Was, that was your training. That was it. Mm-hmm. You're how old? 28, I think, maybe. Doing what you want to do. Mm-hmm. 28. Married at the time. Yep. Dream job at this point in time? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Dr- but drinking from a fire hose. I had I barely knew the rank structure. I barely understood what the 82nd Airborne did. And I walk into a, a tent full of uh, Jay Price from the NNO, who was like super. Oh, yeah. I love that guy. Mm-hmm. Chuck Liddy from the NNO. Yep. And then a um, guy from the, the Washington Post, a guy from the Chicago Tribune, a Fox News crew, and. I think that's it for now. And as soon as I walk in, Chuck Liddy said to us, so, hey, which one of you guys is getting engaged? And that's how it started. Really? First day, yep. Wow. It was awesome, though. It was because it was sink or swim. And I sunk a lot yeah. on that trip, but it, mm-hmm. uh, it was literally like you had no choice. You just had to do it. Like we found bunks in with this one unit, and that first night we got a scud alert, and we all had to run and get in the bunker, and that's how it starts. And you now, just go. Was there... Because uh, because you weren't the only one there, because there were several there, were you almost uh, um, welcomed in a little bit? Diff- Had you been the only reporter there, you might have been maybe ostracized a little bit. But since there were so many of you there, was it almost a different story like, okay, they're here, we might as well welcome them in? How were you welcomed by the I, troops? I actually found it harder when there's a bigger group of reporters. Really? Because they'll herd you into the, and you have your own little tent and you set up your own little media village in a way, mm-hmm. and and the media guys stick together. Okay. And I have a harder, I much like it much better look to just get stuck in with a bunch of soldiers because okay. then you're like the oddity. They want to talk to you usually. Um, if you're pretty clear on the ground rules, if I've got my notebook out, you're on the record. If it's not out, we can talk about anything, and it's not going to go in the newspaper. And then you build that rapport that way. Mm-hmm. But I, I actually I prefer less media. But this was good for me. At the time. At the time, because it was an easier way to try to get up to speed, but it was also very intimidating. Like I was, I was a really not a very good writer at the time. I wasn't too confident in my skills. Um, I was confident I could keep up, right, with the soldiers, not with the writers. The writers were far better than me. Was your stuff compared? I mean, when you sent the stuff back, did they say, "Hey, the guy at the NNO has got this," or "The guy here's got this," or were they just happy to have material from you? over there with people from Fort Bragg? I think they were happy to have the material. If they did compare it, they never told me. Okay. Um, but I was comparing well, myself you, a little uh, Internally, bit. yeah. yeah. I, I know um, you you're, yeah. you have high standards, and I know you, but I'm just wondering if you had some of that grace, as it were, from the guys back in Fayetteville saying, mm-hmm. hey, he's learning, this is still good stuff, and you know, it got better. I think they were happy to have someone over there. Yeah. I think the representative was important to them to have somebody there. Um, but at the time, you know, the war, the, the ground invasion had started. Mm-hmm. So 82nd guys were just sitting around. They were trying to do training. So the stories were bad 
even if you could write them well, because there really wasn't, everybody was just waiting. Right. And then uh, Jessica Lynch gets captured, and yeah. then the 82nd kicks in, and instead of jumping into Baghdad, where they, which is what they were supposed to do, they all get in trucks, and we drive across the border. And that's that's where the media kind of split we could, because it was a really you know mobile war at that point and so you were sort of we found what you found one unit and you rolled with them and then and were you with them most of the time you were there yeah, I was a third battalion three three hundred twenty fifth uh, airborne infantry regiment was did you develop that if the if the if the if the uh, notebooks in the pocket it's off the record. Did you kind of set those ground rules, or how did that all develop to with the guys you were there with? That came. I, I sort of got that down better when I got with the special forces guys. Uh, at the time, I didn't realize I was doing it, but with special forces guys, I usually will open that first meeting when everybody's kind of the butt sniffing period. I usually <laughs> will keep the notebook away for twenty four hours, uh -huh. and then I make it very clear in that first meeting. You know, if it's out, we're on. You're on the record. If it's not out, you're not. If you say something when it's not out that I want to use, we'll talk about it. And I'll ask you before I use it. How was that welcomed? They like it because it sets the ground rule, and then they'll test it. You know, they're going to see if you do it. They're going to they're going to talk to you, and they're going to be conscious of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then once you prove that you know what you say, you'll do. You know, they'll usually let you in and 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 talk to you a little bit better. They also want to see if you can keep up. You know, part of it is, all right, we're going to put you in the back of a truck and we're going to drive you all over Afghanistan. And you're going to look like a powdered donut when you get out. And if you complain, that tells us something. If you just shut up and do your job, it tells us even more. Yeah, you, you rise up in the ranks of respect. Right. Yeah. Scariest time that first deployment? Uh, we were right crossing the border into Iraq. Uh, we just got over the border. I don't know, it's got to be like 3 or something in the morning. Everybody's dog tired. Uh, and I was riding in with the chemical officer who had a magazine full of tracers on the top because he didn't get a chance to zero his rifle, which means he wasn't sure if where he was aiming it's going to hit. So his idea was he's going to walk it in if he has to shoot with tracer rounds, yeah. which look like little laser beams at night. Mm -hmm. And then... I, the, the driver had glasses thicker than mine, and he had a machine gun, which was good. And then the, we're just getting ready to leave, and these civil affairs guys, they're the guys that do wells and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of their officers comes running in. He's got a 9 millimeter. He jumps in the next to me. That's it. So we're driving down this road, and all of a sudden, from the front of the convoy, I start, we start seeing tracers and, and rockets. Uh, we think it's rockets. Uh, ends up being something else. And so everybody dives out of this thing. I dive. My pen explodes all in my lap. I'm hiding underneath the, 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 the truck with all these other guys. I'm thinking, like, we're dead. Because like, this guy's rifle doesn't aim. This guy can't see. <laughs> yeah. This guy's got a 9 millimeter, and he just got here from Indianapolis. Like, he he's barely awake. Right. Um, and then we're, we're sitting there, and we're waiting, and we're listening, and everything's quiet. And all of a sudden, we hear all clear, all clear. And we find out later that the gunner on the front truck had fallen asleep oh, no. and hit the, hit the grenade launcher and fired a bunch of rounds off by accident. Wow. And, but that was when I realized, I was like, wait a second. It was fun. We were playing Army. Like, no one really thought they were going to get hit with a scud. Right. And now, all of a sudden, like, this is... And then in the, when at dawn, you could see all the broken tanks, and you could see all the vehicles disabled, and you could see, you know, what had gone on. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started to sink in a little bit. You know, As a, you know I've been doing this job now for the better part of 30-some years. You try to uh, approach stories and be as objective and, 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 and get away from it as much as you can. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that venue, did you feel anything if you saw somebody get hurt? Did you feel anything if you saw some of the villagers as you went by? Because you're, you're human. It's your first time out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, after a while, I imagine you may have gotten a little used to it. But that first time that stuff happens, like that attack, the first time you see somebody that's hurt or dead or something like that, did you feel anything back then? Sure. Yeah. I still feel it. I mean, uh, what, I, I think my 13th in bed, I, went, I hung out with a medevac unit, and we went out and picked up a, a, an Afghan police officer who'd been shot, and we followed him from the pickup all the way into the hospital. I mean, I saw him break his, his rib cage open and massage his heart to try to get him back to life. I mean, how do you not feel that? Yeah. And how do you not feel for the medic who was, you know, his – you know, tried to keep this guy alive, got sure. him alive to the hospital. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I feel I feel for the villagers. I, I love the Afghans. I, I hang out with the villagers all day. If we're on patrols and stuff and talk to them and, and hang out with them, I love them. So that goes back to the, like, when I'm reporting, yeah. I try to step back. Yeah. But when I'm just there as a human, yeah. you know, I think it's impossible.
Yeah, yeah, and, and and there are still those stories that stick in my mind that I've done over the years, and mm -hmm. I, I imagine the same thing with you. Yeah. Uh, you you kept going back and you kept going back. When did you start getting the idea that I've got material here that I could start writing larger pieces, books or, or articles or stuff like that, rather than just the, the, the stuff you were feeding back for the uh, Fayetteville Observer? I used to tell everybody I was never going to write a book that I wasn't interested in writing books. But I think deep down I was lying. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, th I, I think it came out, I had a, a, an author who wrote an, an oral history of the 82nd in World War II. And he said to me at one point, you should write a book. And I thought, eh. And he got his agent to call me and I talked to his agent for a little bit. Um, and we started working on some projects, but it really never got off the ground until, I, until the Spear on Gar battle. And when I got tipped off to that and got at the ex really an exclusive interview with the commanders there that I realized, wait a second, this is a huge battle. It means something. And, and this might be a good book. Yeah, tell everybody about that, a little bit more about that it. That was a special forces run operation. The Canadians at the time were in charge of southern Afghanistan. And, and the Panjaway Valley is just west of Kandahar City. And it was really the, the birthplace of the Taliban. And this, these three SF teams went in there and took the high ground, uh, this little, the Spearwangar, which is this little man-made mountain in the middle of the, the, the Panjaway Valley. And they, they, they held off the Taliban and saved this, uh, this offensive for the Canadians. And it, it's just an amazing story of, of the, the unity between these Afghans and the Americans and, and this small unit taking these indigenous uh, army and, and, and fighting this battle. And so I thought it was an amazing battle. And at the time, it was 2006. So we were still, you know, there was still, there was still some idea that this war was going to end soon. And this was yeah. going to be a big, big part of that. And so... Um, I started doing research on it. I started to put together a book proposal on it. And that's when I met Rusty Bradley, who, who I was trying to get him to give me an interview to talk me through. It. And he said, well, I'm, I'm working on a book too. And, okay. it, and he was the, one of the ground force commanders. So it didn't make a lot of sense for me to try to race a guy to a book deal for a battle. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't there. Yeah. He was. So yeah. we just sort of, and but I liked him. There was something about him. There's something about Rusty Bradley. He's got it. He's, there's a reason why he's a good Green Beret. Yeah, sure. And so we just sort of joined forces, and uh, and that's how we sold that book. And that's the first book I sold. And that was called Lines of Kandahar. Lines of Kandahar. Yeah. And and when what? Tell me about the process of obviously uh, Rusty Bradley, Mark Owen, some of the others. Mm -hmm. Their name is there with Kevin Maurer. Right. Talk to me about how that process goes. Because are they dictating to you? Do they tell you the story and you put it into written verbiage? Give me an idea of the process for that whole thing. It's a, it, they, they all vary, but the, the, the nuts and bolts is basically, I usually will sit down and interview them, and then I will draft, based on those interviews, these chapters. And then we, we together will go through and make sure that it's, it's correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm big on, and the first meeting I have with all these guys is, you know, every word I write, you own. So don't let me put something in there yeah. or take something too far that you think is that's not true because you have to own everything. And so that if that, we use that as a guideline, usually that works out quite well and we can, we move along. But for, for Mark Owen, it was, I just interviewed him for half a day. I'd usually get there at like nine or 10 and we, we work till 1231. And then mm -hmm. I'd go back and transcribe and write the rest of the day. And, and that then was go back the next day and do the same kind of thing. Five days a week. And how long did the process take? I think I wrote that one in six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. What about um, uh, Valleys of Death? Okay. Bill Richardson is a legend in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. The guy's story is amazing. And I saw him tell it to a bunch of PO, uh, uh, survival, seer students, survival and uh, evasion that they teach the Green Brace how right. you know what to do if they're their POWs. Right. And he came in and told this story and I thought, holy moly, this is an amazing story. So I wrote a really long sort of newspaper story about him, following his whole career and, and, and everything. And he uh and I said, This is an amazing book. So I was working on that as a book before I ran into Rusty Bradley. So I sold Rusty Bradley's book, mm -hmm. finished it, and then turned around and sold Valleys of Death. And then wrote that one. That one, he wrote a lot of it, and then I would rewrite him. Okay. Um, and then I wrote that. And then, I, and then that book came. So they really, it, I was really starting with Valleys of Death, but v Lions of Canada came out first. Yeah. But, or did it come out first? Yeah, it did. No. Yeah, I think, I mean, in, the, yeah. in a chronology, chronology um, Valleys of Death is listed as first in 2010. Right. Lines of Kandahar is 2011. Right. Sorry, and so, then Gentleman Bastards of 2012. Right. Yeah. So 
in the, in the process of, of getting this all done, um, do you, you're, you're still reporting for the Fayetteville Observer at the time, or did you take a leave? How did you get your career to the point where you had the, the time to do it, or did you, did you just do them both at the same time? I do them both at the same time. Uh, 2000, let's see, I started it as a Fayetteville Observer reporter, and then the AP hired me. Right. And I moved down here in 2008. Mm-hmm. But I still did AP in the day and wrote wrote the books at night. So that's how you did it? Mm-hmm. And weekends, nights and weekends. Did you, and, and your wife must be a saint, because I imagine that my wife, I, you know, my people know my wife as a saint. Mm-hmm. What's What's it been like for her and your kids knowing that dad is writing all these things and getting so, and even going overseas and being a part of this thing. My wife had the hardest job, really. I mean, I dragged her. She's from New England, and I took her from Boston to D.C., where she lived over a while, so she didn't mind that trip, right. to Fayetteville, yeah. which at the time, Fayetteville's gotten a lot better than when we moved in, she moved there, and then, uh, and then I left like three months into that yeah. that job. And then I was gone, I don't know, 12, 10, 12 times. I can't remember. And how long were you gone for usually? One to two months. Yeah. Uh, so she really, ha- she really had to, f- you know, it was an odd marriage initially because, you know, she's by herself in Fayetteville. So she sort of had to find she's her She's almost like way. a military wife. Very much so, yeah. yeah. Uh, which gave, gave us a glimpse of sort of what the sacrifice that those families make. Yeah. Uh, and then she just got used to it. I, th- I think just much like uh, the, the military wise, they just—it's just part of the the deal, you know. Were there discussions over safety? I mean, obviously you have to because you're going over there with those people, but you know, it's a different level of relationship mm-hmm. when you're seeing each other every day and coming home and cooking, you know, ham and broccoli and whatever the case is. But you're eating MREs over there and 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 you know, getting away from tracers, and she's back here. So did you talk a lot during that time? Yeah, I mean, we talked a lot. At one, at one point, she met me in uh, Istanbul, so that was a fun. That was fun yeah. for us. Um, but we, for the most part, no. I mean, we don't really get into the details of it. I just it wasn't. Yeah, and the kids. The kids, they didn't really know what was going on. Uh, my oldest, Charlie, really didn't have any idea what was going on. He's just, I think, getting a sense now of what these books mean, and he's got an interest in them, and he's 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 reading, like he's into Crichton now. He's reading Crichton books nice. at at eleven, which is better than me yeah really. um and he, he's interested in getting in, into the books i think at some point so nice. we'll, we'll see and your other he, son he's five so, so he's so they don't have really much of a, a concept of mm-hmm. dad and, and going overseas no i went over to i went to afghanistan a couple of years ago i went to uganda last year mm-hmm. for about but if i'm going quick i'm going week 10 days yeah i'm not doing the two two ones yeah. anymore so um gentlemen bastards tell me about that one there's a good idea that needed a better execution People love it. It's like my cult classic. Like people who've read my stuff, they they'll re- end up finding that one at some point. And they usually, if you like me, you'll like it. If you don't, my 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 brother who's in the book hates it. He thinks it's the worst one of all of them. Um, Robin Robin Moore wrote a book called The Green Berets, and he right. was the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was reading The Green Berets and thinking, you know, so much has changed, but so much hasn't. And this would be an amazing book to remake. I mean, take the Hollywood idea, remake a great book. So that was what the pitch was. Mm-hmm. Um, it just didn't come through, come together. It, too much of it was based on reporting yeah. and, and access. And I got great access to this team, but the team just never found their groove in, in the mission. They're, they were amazing guys, but their mission be, it was interesting because it became indicative of sort of the, the war itself. The whole itself. effort itself, yeah. So in some ways it works in that vein, yeah. but going into it and the idea was to be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and I never really wanted to be the main character. So part of the problem... I'd like to go back and do a book similar to that just to read because I made some mistakes because it's we're trained not to be the story. Yeah. And I need and I needed to be the story because I was the only one that changed. And instead of being my normal reporter self, like I went whole hog, like I bought in, I drank the Kool-Aid and that was a I had to kind of that was odd. Yeah. So it was in that sense that it was interesting. It was an experiment, and I'm glad I did it. But I, I'd like to go back and do it again or do well, something I mean, similar. There's fit. nothing to say you can't. I mean, you know, yeah. on down the line. Speaking, you mentioned the word access. Mm-hmm. Now it's one thing to have access to to do the daily Fayetteville Observer kind of articles, but to get the access to do some of the things that you've done, do you have to wait longer to ask for the ability to write the story? I mean. Uh, how good a relationship do you have to have to do some of the things that you've done with the people you've done them with? 
pretty good, but it, I didn't start that way. I mean, I, I, I ran into Special Forces the first time in Karbala, Iraq in 03, mm-hmm. and I knew immediately I wanted to get an embed with them. And everyone told me I would never get it. And it took me a year, and I started asking as soon as I got back from my first embed. Um, then I got the embed in 2004 um, in Afghanistan with an ODA. Um, but it just, you build, and then once I get that one, mm-hmm. it, all of a sudden the reputation starts to build there. I was, yeah. I, I was on, you know, he's not an idiot. He writes right. what he says he's going to do, you know, and he doesn't get in the way. Uh, How different was it going with the 82nd Airborne and then going with the Special Forces? Oh, it's light years different. I mean, the 82nd's not built to, they're, they're in a conventional military unit. So right. it's, a, it's, a, it's a top-down structure. SF is a, it's not completely bottom up, but it's a lot of bottom up. I mean, for the most part, the most experienced guys is not, uh, it's not the commanding. That's the commanding. The guys executing things. It's the guys yeah. that are doing it. And they're all sort of bought in. They all get, you know, they all get a seat at the table. They, you get asked if you're, you know, the senior engineer sergeant. Heck, if you're the junior engineer sergeant, they'll ask you because you have a job. You're, you're doing something specifically for the team. And that's a whole different structure. And the kind of things that they let you see, did there, was there some things that you couldn't see? Um, for general ambassadors, not really. Very rare. I was pretty much, I mean, I helped them build their base. At, at one point towards the end, they said, hey, we need a rear gunner going back to Kandahar. Do you want to be the rear gunner? And for a split second, I said, yeah. And then I thought, man, no, yeah. that's a bad idea. Because, I mean, I'm not sure if you go through all the, like just getting through the gate and clearing the, clearing the weapon, I'm not. I, I know how to do it, but not really. Yeah. If we actually got in a fight, I mean, I'm not trained to fight with them, live ammo. Yeah. You know? so, it sure would make a good ending to a movie, though. But it would it? make a great And I was thinking about the book. Uh, like, I'm not too too uh, ashamed to say that. I was like, wow, I had a great ending. That was going to say that. I could, yeah. I, could see that I could see that ending to it, the last seven or eight minutes of a film right there. And the yeah. smoke clearing and uh, Kevin's face pops up at the back of the, back yeah. of the gunner. Save the day. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Let the reporter save the day this time. Yeah, there you go. How did you come across Mark Owen? I got a call from my agent that said that his buddy, uh, this editor, Ben Severe, had a project that he was looking for co-writers on. And I, at that point, was like, I don't know how much co-writing I want to do. My agent was like, I think let's just try this one. So I sent him everything. And then it's like two... Like too much sent later. him by sent him you mean well, copies of all my books including oh, okay. gentleman ambassadors which wasn't finished yet it was still a kind of a rough draft mm-hmm. um and then i think that happened in the fall and then that january i got the call um and my agent said look i'm going to send you a non-disclosure agreement sign it fax it back and then ben severe is going to call you and so i'd been googling ben severe trying to figure out what has he got yeah. um what is this project so I, I, I looked at the NDA and it was I think it was a half no it was a, yeah half a million dollars if I violated the NDA. No, that's serious stuff. So that's yeah. So yeah. I signed it. I faxed it back. Ben called me and said uh, I have one of the seals on the Bin Laden raid. Is going to win a book. We're looking for co-writers. Can you be in DC on this was a Thursday or Friday? He said, Can you be in DC on Monday? Yes. I, I said I'll be I'll yeah. be in DC six and a half hours from now yeah. if you want me to. When do you need me? Yeah. Um. But I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. So I had to go into the Star News because at that time I had wor- started working on the Star News. I'd yeah. come back from Afghanistan. They had a position open and it, I like being a reporter. So sure. I'm in. Yeah. Um, and so I drive up to DC that Monday. I got my tie, my jacket. I'm ready. I, I meet him. He's dressed in flip flops and jeans and a t-shirt and we sit down with his agent and we, it's one of those moments where his agent's sitting on one side of the booth and he's sitting on the other and you're like, right, where do you sit? Yeah. <laughs> End of the table, maybe? <laughs> I sat next to him. Yeah. My, and I, the reason why is I felt like, all right, if we're going to be a team, we're going to be a team. Yeah. So I sat next to him. We had a long talk, about an hour talk. We drank tea. He had brought these giant cupcakes, which is odd, right? Yeah. Giant cupcakes. And I hate chocolate. I despise chocolate. Really? He brings this, puts this big chocolate cupcake in front of me. I ate half of it. I wanted that job so badly. I'll eat anything. Yeah. Got through the um, interview. And drove back to Wilmington. I felt good about it. There wasn't really much. I, if I wasn't going to get it, I was. I would be. You know, obviously, I'd wanted sure, the job, but yeah, if, I, yeah. I couldn't do any more. Yeah. Next day, I got a call. Hey, we'll do it. Here's what we're going to pay you. Um, you got to start next week. Can you be in Virginia Beach next week? Yeah. So I had to go into the Star News and quit. Yeah. And With tell a week and tell them, I can't tell you what I'm doing. Yeah. That was a difficult conversation. It was weird, but they were cool about it. Yeah. They said, call us when you're done. Um, That's nice. Went back to tell my wife that I was, I told her that I had this opportunity, that if we got it, we had to do it. 
can't tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. And then I called my parents up and said, I need to move back into your house because they live in Virginia Beach. Yeah. I uh, live in my old room and I uh, can't tell you what I'm doing. And my dad, who was a, fe a federal agent, he used to do stuff like, like so you run into a lot of traffic. Where are you going? Where are you guys? Where, where are you headed? Like just trying to feel it out of me a little bit. Um, yeah, he's, he's experienced in trying to get information yeah. from people. Yeah. And I lived up there for a couple of months. And I, so I would drive up on Sundays from Wilmington, stay until Friday, turn in two chapters. So we were writing two chapters a week. Then drive back to Wilmington, drive back on Sunday. Yeah. You mentioned, here's what we're going to pay you. I don't want to ask you to disclose it. Mm -hmm. Was it more or less than what you thought? Would you have taken it for half the price? Mm, I would have done it for a dollar. Yeah. It was just one of those, because right after the Bin Laden raid, I called a buddy of mine at JSOC and said, what are the chances I can get in there and get this? Like, I've done all the, you know me, we've worked together. Like, what are the chances you'd let me come in there? Come in there into the compound? Yeah, and, and meet these guys and do this story. Like, oh, okay. you, you need right. to, like, this is going to come out at some point. And yeah. he said, it'll never come out. They won't, so, they won't talk. So when that call came, I thought, hmm. Yeah. Like, how would I not want to do this? Yeah. It's the book that everybody wanted. Sure. Yeah. And as you're going through this, um, eyebrows raise, can't believe it. But you had some experience with special forces so mm -hmm. i imagine was there any surprising material as you heard him tell his story i had a lot of army special forces experience i didn't have a lot of with the seals the, the seals to me were guys i ran from in bars in virginia beach like i just didn't really i didn't know them that well i knew what they did and i i had seen them in the you know in afghanistan but i'd never spent that much time with the seals so he and i i had to learn seals while i worked, did this book and how tough was that it's not tough. They, they, it's all, it's one, all right, so Special Operations is one big tribe, and then the Seals are a little tribe, and the Green Braves are a little tribe, and mm -hmm. they all have their little things. Um, there's a whole chapter in uh, General Ambassadors that delves into how they, they like and dislike each other. And so mm -hmm. I kind of knew that, but when you get into the Tier 1 units like Delta, mm -hmm. and you get into like SEAL Team 6, those guys, they're kind of a cut above. They're different even from the, the tribes they come from. Could you tell he was different? Yeah, because there's there's a there's a confidence to them, but there's a there's also an intelligence. They're they're perceptive and they're confident. But I mean, when you're trained at that level, oh, yeah. like there's, he gave me a list one time of everything he can do, and Jason Bourne would blush with uh, the things really? that these guys these guys can do things. Yeah, as I as I read, as I read the um, what they did even after they found Bin Laden upstairs. I mean, it's everything from. You know, take DNA samples, mm -hmm. treat wounds, mm -hmm. gather and know intelligence. I mean, it, it runs the gamut of what it would normally take four, five, six people to do in the real world. Mm -hmm. These guys could do maybe not to the expert level, but enough to gather at that point in time some of the most, you know, uh, you know intelligence that everybody in the world wanted. I mean, if they can come into this room, hack your computer, right? build a bomb with the chemicals in the kitchen and then hotwire your car and escape. Yeah. I mean, they're the closest thing to James Bond. Yeah. So as this process unfolded, mm -hmm. are, are you just getting more excited to, to, that this is going to come out more excited than the other books you put together? No, because it was such a pressure cooker to get it done. And I had so many, I had, you know, editors and I had agents and people that were uh, like reading rough. I mean, they were reading horrible chapters at first and freaking out. And I kept telling them, relax, I don't know the story yet. You, you want chapters to two a week. I've got to crap out a chapter to every two, you know, two chapters so a week. So how did, how did it start? Did it start with him or did it start with the raid? How did you start the process? Did you learn him first and then decide how you were going to put the book together? We, I, he told me the story first. And I knew sort of the raid was going to be the, the climax. That's the sure. backbone of it. Yeah, and yeah. then we had a long discussion with, with Ben, the editor, and with his agent, Elise, to discuss how... What's the front book? Because people just wanted the raid, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really why you bought it. So we had to make the front. Why do you need to read the front? Why not just flip to chapter nine where the raid starts? Sure. And so my argument was we need the front to show you why these guys did this raid and why they were successful. Mm -hmm. Like, What does it take to do this? It's a, it's a taste of right. what's to come. And then you go back into the, for those of you who haven't read it, um, you know, those who, um, you know, 
those do the training and then you meet some of the you know some of the uh, security people and then you meet some of the uh, intelligence people and then the raid brings everybody together and everybody has done their job and then right. that's how it's so successful exactly so that's and so I, I had some different ideas like I, I I had one idea where you never left the raid and then the times when you met other characters we could flash back gotcha. and, and, and give you but then it, it would slow the raid down too much. So what we did is we tried to compress that front mm -hmm. so that you met everybody you're going to need to know on the raid so that when they show up, you're like, oh, I know that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with oh the structure. Lord. I yeah. mean, I think the structure works. Yeah, oh, it does. It very so. much does. I, I, did anything in the whole deal surprise you? I'm going to tell you what surprised me mm -hmm. and what I was like, oh, my Lord. But did anything surprise you about the story, the raid, and everything else after? What surprised, what I liked the most, what surprised me the most, what found my interest, the, the actual nuts and bolts of the raid didn't, I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's right. actually not even that sophisticated, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, the psyche of them, how they could almost crash the helicopter, jump out yeah. and still complete everything and yeah. within the time limit, but then what that impact was how the fact that they didn't control the helicopter and that was the one thing they could control everything else on the target except for the helicopter and that's what messed them up more than anything else and that was what the psyche of this idea of this this obsession of control of of, of planning to the point where anything happens they can they know what to do yeah the amazing thing to me two things number one the uh um the well, they found the, the dye that Bin Laden used to dye his beard. Mm -hmm. Stuff you can go down here to the Harris Teeter and buy. And I'm, it escapes me right now. Just for men. Just for men. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you look up there, there's a box of just for men there that he used. And I'm like, really? Mm -hmm. In this compound with the most wanted terrorist, there's just for men. The second thing is when they found the two guns, neither one was loaded. Mm -hmm. And then you go into explaining the whole thing about the hierarchy the higher it goes, the less of a chance there's going to be any pushback. I found that fascinating. That's a joke that they've told forever. Like, you don't see any old suicide bombers. Like, yeah, this idea I, I that just, they push it down on them is... Yeah, the fact that up, you know, up there, they're not going to fight for as much as the idea, but they're going mm -hmm. to tell somebody who puts on a bomb, you're the key to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. That was just... That, that's what I as, I... as I got through that chapter, I was like, man, what a great point to point out. Yeah, it dawned on me when he, we, he talked about it, and, and I and it, I think it stuck with him too. It was a, it was a point that he made often when yeah. he would retell the story about how you know he didn't even want to fight, he didn't even try to fight. No, yeah, interesting. So the book comes out. Mm -hmm. You at some point in time had to see Kevin Maurer, number one New York Times bestseller. I was covering an agenda review at the New Hanover County Commissioners, <laughs> and I got a call from the from my editor who said. Uh, God, but he asked me some other question and he said yeah the list will be out um tomorrow congratulations you're on the list and i said what number and he was like you're number one and i thought no and so it didn't dawn on me until my agent called and he was yeah. like hey congratulations and then i was like hmm, that's pretty cool and then when they, it actually came out and what's cool dutton what they did the publisher they sent you a leather they sent us a leather bound copy of it when nice. it gets on the which is really cool and they sent us a, a nice uh with the, the jacket and the first first week it was a uh, number one bestseller so I mean, I what was weird is I was working at the uh, the Star News at the time. I was I think it was the night editor, and so I spent a, I would come in at night and I would do some work. Um, but I always would sit in the budget meetings when we go over what's going to go in the next day's paper. And on the crawl was like no easy day this, no easy day that, and yeah. that was really weird. Yeah. So how'd you go back to covering that agenda review after you got that phone call? I liked it. I didn't have a problem with it. Like, yeah, okay. I, yeah. I mean, I I like being a reporter. Yeah. So yeah. to me, I just had. But I mean. Stand up a little bit straighter, maybe. And uh... I was a little embarrassed of it. Huh. Not embarrassed in the sense that I wasn't ashamed of any of it. I yeah. just, I was there to, to just be there. Like I'm used to just being the reporter in the corner, and I can yeah. get the information. And I've got my sources. I can do my job. And mm -hmm. when that people were reading the book, yeah. you know, and people wanted to talk about the book, which is awesome, and yeah. I'm glad they were reading it. Yeah. But it, I always felt like. I always had to get through a little bit of that conversation before I could get to, hey, what about trash? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So in some ways, it, you know, I got in the way, yeah. but I, I, you know, you have, I'm going to be mad that people are, you know, engaged yeah. by it? No. No, sure. The fallout afterwards. Mm -hmm. How did it affect you? Because you were asked for a quote afterwards. I mean, you know, when the Pentagon came out and said that, you know, it gave away some secrets. And there was a, you had a quote, and your quote was, was fairly, you know, 
uh, you said um, he was meticulous about offering, um, uh, about adhering to his desire to never do anything to undermine the SEAL's mission to put his former colleagues in harm's way. So all of this discussion is going on, and you're just saying, look, I believe this guy. Mm -hmm. I believe it's good. But how did you get, how did that kind of catch up with you at all? I, was, I felt bad for him. I mean, it was a it was a guy who lived in this culture, in this community, and then all of a sudden, the people that he's worked for and he's he's you know sacrificed for are now saying, "No, you screwed this up." So really, I felt worse for him more than yeah. anything else, and it, it took a toll. Um, I felt you know on him that I don't think it was fair. I was talking to the Pentagon. I was talking to SOCOM. I was talking to JSOC. This idea that, I mean, I, when they, when there's a line in these stories where they say, well, they've obtained copies. Yeah, because I sent them copies. Like yeah. this, I, it got out of hand. I got to see actually what it was like to see media frenzy, yeah. which was odd. It was, it was a very weird feeling to be, you know, one day writing a story and then also answering crazy emails from reporters. Yeah. So. When did it take? the step to getting there though because didn't they had to know this was coming out they had to know what was in it correct no they didn't they didn't know until i called them okay uh, and at that point uh, another media organization had tipped them off about the 60 minutes interview and they were trying to figure out what was going on okay so that's where i started reaching out to my sources and my contacts yeah. in those communities and saying all right calm down yeah. i'm part of this here's the thing i'll get you a copy and i got them copies Mm -hmm. And what kind, of, what kind of feedback did you get? Unofficially from them, they were like, yeah, I didn't see anything. But technically, JSOC, mm -hmm. if you say that JSOC is an operational command and SEAL Team 6 works for them, is classified. Because uh, technically, JSOC is a training and a, a doctrine command and doesn't do anything operational, which is ridiculous. But yeah. that's technically it. So uh, technically, they're right. Yeah. But common sense says otherwise. Mark had to uh, ultimately pay back mm -hmm. a lot of money. Yeah. Um, did you have to, did any of that financial or penalties in any way impact you? No, I was exempted from it, which was, which was cool. But the, the, the shame of it is that money w went back to the, the government. It was not, he, it wasn't his money. He yeah. wanted to donate it. It was the plan from the first day I signed on to this was to donate that money. Right. And so that, that's the shame of it. That's a lot of money that could have gone to some good. To a charity yeah. or whatever the thing was, yeah. Which I never could figure out why the government would not budge on. You know, you can take it away from him, mm -hmm. but then allow him to donate it. Yeah. Like he's not profiting on it. Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's the shame. That's, that's really the sad story out of this. How important was that book? in your mind to be told the way it was told do you think it would have come out anyway if somebody else would have told it or do you think the way it was told was important the way it was done i think it's in, i think it was important to tell it first person the way it was told i think i think the american people wanted to know the story i think they i don't know i i feel like it was it was a story that it, it gave some closure i think it's an important book i think i think it in that way yeah. And I think it ultimately shows you the sacrifice of these guys that actually go out and do this. And yeah. I think that's important. Now, you worked with Mark again mm -hmm. in 2014, No Hero, The Evolution of a Navy SEAL. Right. The, the, the fallout was still happening over the first book. So in the second one, was there any difference? I mean, uh, did you approach it the same way as you approached the first one? Same way as before, but the government just just redacted the heck out of it. I mean, they, we, had to, we put it through their official channel, and they just tore it apart. Um, they they redacted a whole page at one point that was based on his own recollection. It had nothing to do with, it was just what he was recalling they didn't like, and they, they took it completely out. Yeah. So I'm not a fan of the DOD process. I, I think it's, sometimes it's arbitrary because mm -hmm. um, I've gone through it a couple of times now, and I, I find sometimes that I don't, I don't get it. I've just gone through the FBI one. I thought the FBI process was really good. Yeah. They were really smart, really conscious of things, really thorough, and then, you know, and fair. You got into at that same time, about 14, because the No Hero book came out in 14, you got to work for a Marvel Comics, mm -hmm. The Punisher. Yep. Boy, talk about, you know, going from one side of the coin to the other side. Yeah. Is comics fun? Writing comics fun? Oh, it's the best. It's the best, because it, it, you write, it's a little mini movies without a budget. So yeah. whatever you want to happen can happen. And, and the, the, I like the idea of taking what I write on paper, and then you turn it to, over to an artist. And when it comes back, it's always better. 
because yeah. they always say, all right, they're more visual than I am. So they're like, all right, well, that's that's cool. I see the plot point. Here's how we're going to do it visually. And it's I, that's what I like the best. So how does that process work? You, 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 is there a, a, a length you have to give them and then they take it? Because I, I'm not a, a comics guy, so right. I, I know you are. You grew up reading them, you said. I read some I did. research. Yeah. So, and you're with Marvel, so you can't get a whole lot bigger than, I mean, it's a quality deal. It's not like mm -hmm. Joe's comics and, you know. Right. So how does that process work? You have to submit 30 pages, 60 pages? How it's 20, 20, 22 pages per per issue. Mm -hmm. And a buddy of mine was writing The Punisher at the time, and he wanted, I don't know, I can't exactly remember why he wanted me to, to do one, one issue. It was initially one issue. And there was seven and eight, so but, it was two, right? But then they split it in two. I actually think it's a better story as one. But two issues, and then uh, I basically came up with the idea of all the all the SF guys and seals. They have Punisher patches, and I was like, why do they wear these Punisher patches? I know why they do now in reality, but if if Marvel was real, why would they wear Punisher patches? And so I tried to come up with a story that would explain why they wear Mar uh, the Punisher patch, and that's where that's the genesis of the story. So you, but your 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 mind can go anywhere because mm -hmm. most of your books were were on fact and, and recollection of fact but this is you're letting your mind go wherever you want it to go right right well the idea was to try to be as authentic as i could because a, a lot i read a lot of stuff with with military guys and they they always some of it could be better with is with this authenticity so i thought sure. well let's make the punish this one as authentic as i can make it so you know we get the whole drone strike which is exactly how they call in drone strikes that's real drone chatter that they yeah. would get you know so the sf relationship um all those things I try to, some of the lingo they use in it, uh, I've embedded some of their mottos where guys will say some of the things just because the ASF guys, when they read it, will get it. Yeah. So that was and you like fun. to have that little, oh, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, that was fun. Good deal. Fun. So then you do an Avengers and X-Men called Axis, right? Right. All right. So this is one they called me and they, they said I could do a 10-page a story for this event. Uh, and they let me do drunk frat boy Thor. Just yeah. traveling around, just <laughs> acting like a fool. Uh, and I didn't think they would let me get away with things like peeing off the Chrysler building. They said it was cool. So, And that, that had to be even more fun. That was the best. And that, that was a reporter follows Thor from New York to Las Vegas. And it was like a, there was a, a, a 10 pages of a little gap in, this, in the regular series they were running that just yeah. explained how we went from New York to Vegas. And that's all it was. It was that simple. And how did that, I mean, how does something like that come about? Somebody just call you and say, I know this guy, let's give him a shot? Or The editor on The Punisher asked me if I wanted to pitch. So I pitched three or four characters, and the drunk frat boy Thor was the one they picked, which was awesome. That's nice. Yeah. So then Hunter Killer. The drone the, book. Uh, the Inside America's on, uh, on the drone strike book. Mm -hmm. is, is that another one you wanted to do, or is that another one you got a call about? That, uh, McCurley called me. And said he had wanted to write a book, he had written some pages, but no one would buy it or some, something along those lines. And I said, well, come on, I think this could really sell. So I helped him sort of along. We sort of teamed up to get it sold. I wanted to do it because I'd never done an Air Force book. And I thought the drone war was sort of fascinating. And, and I thought, I, again, I, I always like think third person first. Mm -hmm. But I felt like this one, because of, of the sort of what, what we know about drones, it might be better for one guy who's done it for as long and, and his career is kind of amazing in that he was there in the beginning and he's been all the way through to the end. So mm -hmm. it just worked out. Yeah. And the new one, mm -hmm. um, I mean, Secret Wars, the, the journal Battlefield comic was 16. Yeah. But the new one you have coming out, the American radical inside the world of an undercover Muslim FBI agent. Right. Genesis of this one. Uh, ben Severe again calls me. Uh, I had been working on a book for him that just never came together and we had decided that it wasn't going to work. Um, and so I was looking for a project, and he called me a couple of days later and said, I had this thing. I just bought this book. Uh, you got to do this one um, if I can. I, and so Tamara called me, uh, and I was actually at the uh, – right, uh, right at the uh, – um, in front of Old Navy. I, first, I just pulled in because I wanted to not drive. I wanted to actually be able to concentrate. So I think sure. I was sitting in front of Old Navy in yeah. the parking lot there. And he called me, and he told me this story about how he, he grew up – or he was born in Egypt – you know, came over here as an immigrant. After 9-11, he knew he had to help, uh, you know, native speaker, and then slowly but surely ends up getting to the point where he, he infiltrates this Al-Qaeda plot in Canada that was looking at blowing up a, a train between Canada and New York, as well as 
some targets in the United States, and he spends months with these guys and gets to be their 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 financiers who he's posing as. And I immediately jump. I mean, this oh, yeah. it's a story that has never been. I've never seen it. Yeah, not to this level. Mm -mm. And you know, he's like I joke with him. He's Brown James Bond. Like he infiltrated these guys to the point where they believed he was a Al Qaeda financier. And it's a fast. What it is, it's a fascinating look at terrorism. And it's yeah. a fascinating look at guys who we only see in the news. And it, 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 well, we, because I got FBI transcripts and surveillance videos, so I've got exactly what they said. And, what, and the way they rationalize terror and the way that they bicker amongst each other about who's the, bigger, who's the best terrorist, who's more devout. So all these little things. And, and at the end, what we took away from is, you know, what makes America great, what makes us very powerful is that you can't attack us anywhere. We've got people that look like everybody. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter what you look like. If you know, if you, if, if terrorism was Latin American, we've got Latin Americans. Yeah. You know, same. How did you go about getting some of the things, though? I mean, did you have to have FBI buy in on this? And I would imagine that was difficult to, to, to secure. The case was declassified because it was tried in Canada. So okay. so the surveillance stuff and the uh, was mostly declassified at that point, And he had it. So he gave me okay. just tons of material. And I would interview him. Um, cause he's in the New York area. I would interview him on the phone at night and then I would write during the day. And that's how we, we wrote that one. I took, I, I got it like last July and I think I wrote it in, I had turned it in February. So I wrote this one quickly. Yeah. Well, so you're literally on the phone and just, uh, and just transcribing or you record them and then go back over them later. How do you do that work? I record them and then go back over it later. And I usually, uh, on these kind of things, I just op ask really open-ended questions. And then I ask the detail stuff. So I'll say, when you met him in the, tr in the car and you guys talked about this, you know, tell me about that. And then I'll let him talk for 45 minutes. Just let him go. Yeah. And then I'll go back and say, all right, at one point you said you took a sip of something. What did you take a sip of? Yeah. What were you wearing? What was he wearing? You know, and, the, and the, those are the, at first people are like, why do you want to know this? Because those oh, are the yeah. little bit yeah. that you can put you right there yeah and when you read a book you notice stuff like that for, yeah. for people who read and for those of us who who who, who do it um, when you finish a book what's the feeling like uh, it's, it's, I like it it's happy I, I actually it's terror because I got to find something else to do really <laughs> and then uh, and I never read them again I never read them again once they're done and it's final and we've done all the edits and everybody's happy and they're sending the publisher or the printer and it's finished I never open it and read it again ever what? Second ex-wife. I had a really good time, and I'm done. I'm <laughs> on to the next one. Yeah, but uh, see, that that's, yeah, I can understand that, because you spend literally yeah. how many hours on it. You almost kind of want to put it aside and say, okay, that's done. Walk mm -hmm. that step, you know, play that hole. Let's go to the next one. Right. I mean, I love every one of the books. I, there's problems. I can find a problem with every one of them. I love every one of them. There's certain parts I love every one of them. I know I'd never read them, ever. The only time I've ever gone back to read them is I was at a writing conference once, and we had spent two days ripping on these amateur writers, their first 10 lines of their book. So for my keynote, I just reread the 10, line, 10 lines of my book and then we ripped on them. Mm -hmm. But I don't read them otherwise. What's the best time you've had going out, talking about these books, you know, actually going out and, and, and being interviewed for them? Was there a, a, a best one that was re received? Was there a best trip you took with Mark, with some of the other guys um, talking about the book? I enjoy working, like I've, I've done this a couple, I've done this three times now, working with 60 Minutes, and in particular, a couple of their producers on stories about the book. I enjoy the behind the scenes stuff. Like I, I very rarely get interviewed about them. Yeah, I'm the with guy, as my brother uh, likes to tell me. He's going to make t-shirts and say with Kevin Maurer on them because that's that's <laughs> yeah. what I am. I, you know, people want to talk to the principal guy, not me. So I don't do a lot of the media. But th was there a trip that you took that you that was particularly enjoyable? We went to New York right after the 60 Minutes interview for Mark Owen, and uh, the driver it was the one time they I felt like royalty. And the publisher had sent a driver and they had my name, and I got to get in the car with the driver. And the driver said, "You know, hey, I saw you saw in sixty minutes. I can't wait to read the book. Congratulations, all that stuff." And nice. I said, "Hey, I got to drive and pick up a buddy of mine at the other terminal. You mind picking him up?" Drove over there. Mark Owen got in the back. We're driving into the city. We're bullshitting a little. Oop, we're talking a little bit, and uh, driver. Driver's not paying attention yet, but he's sort of looking and looking, looking, looking. And at the end, 
we, I realized that the disguise was so good, he didn't even recognize him until they heard us talking. And that's when he finally dawned on him. Who oh, was. really? Yeah. With Mark was all disguised? Mm-hmm. In the 60 Minutes piece. Yeah. So, yeah, everybody seems to think that they know what he looks like. They don't really know what he looks like. <laughs> you, still have, you still keep up with him? Talk to him every once in a while? I do. Yeah. How's he doing now? He's doing well. Yeah, he's, he, I think he's happy. He's got, he's got some business opportunities, and, and he's, he's sort of going about his life now. I'm, I'm really impressed with how he's he's transitioned. I know, I know transition's a big deal for these guys, and, and the way he's handled it, I think, hasn't been all you know. It hasn't been easy, yeah. but I think he's done a really good job with it. What's next for uh, for you, Kevin Marr? I got a couple, I got a book proposal out now to publishers that hopefully gets. You know, hopefully get some news on it here soon. I've got another local story for the first time. I think I found a local one that I'm going to do. Um, digging into that a little bit. I'm mm-hmm. working with the Star News still because I like being a reporter. Yeah, you you just you just like the reporting side of things, don't you? I whether it's it. Gen X, whether it's Agenda Brief, mm-hmm. whether it's the raid that killed Osama bin Laden, you treat them all the same. Yeah, I try to. I like I just like being a reporter. I like chatting with people. I like digging into the story. So it doesn't local national it doesn't matter. Yeah. Will you ever do a James Bond kind of novel, or do you want to be the guy who gets told the story and turn it around? Have you thought about doing some other kind of writing? Yeah, I, you know, I've got a novel going. I got a problem with deadlines. So if you don't tell me, you know, we really want this novel and we need it, you know, at this time, I'm going to find other things to do. So yeah. I've got to just create an artificial deadline or something. Yeah, I've dabbled at it. You know, I I got a couple novel ideas I think I'd like to do. I'd like to just write a trashy airport novel. I got a really good idea for that one. Just write it and just be done with it. And see so what happens. Just under let a people name. read it. No, put it. I don't care. <laughs> the point is just I just to write a book that you buy at the airport right. and you you can read it on one flight yeah. and then you're done. Yeah. It was fun. Yeah. I mean that's really I'm not a like guys like I, I hung I hang out with guys like Wiley Cash who are just beautiful mm-hmm. literary fiction writers who just are masters of the language. I, di- I, dig- I dig ditches. I find good stories in and I, I dig them and I'm done. Who do you enjoy reading? Um, I like Hampton Sides quite a bit. I like uh, Mark Bowden, obviously. Mark Bowden's been an influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Dave Zucchino. He's got a couple of books, but he's also a phenomenal reporter. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the last big one. I, Elmore Leonard. Okay. Just because it's so right there. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's not yeah. overly... Decorated. Yeah. What do you do to relax? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see you relaxing a whole heck of a lot, but when you want to relax and get away, what do you do? I mean, I watch, I mean, it's, it's football season. So I watch the football. I try to get every Sunday. Yeah. I try to do that. Um, I read cause you can't be a good writer if you don't read. So right. I try to read as much as I can. Um, movies. I like to go to the movies. Do you critique other people's writing? Sometimes I don't read a lot of nonfiction um, military books because all I do is try to think yeah. about why they made that decision or how they got that or yeah. I would have put that here. So I, I, it's hard for me to turn that part off. Um, I like to read a lot of fiction, Elmore Leonard stuff like that, yeah. kind of fun, breezy are stuff. You a, are you a, a Brad Thor kind of uh, mm-hmm. Mitch Rapp kind of thing? No. No? To be honest, I, I, they're really good books. They're really suspenseful and they're really well written for the most part. I don't like the underlying agenda sometimes that I just can't get over. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. Well, the new book coming out is American Radical Inside the World of an Undercover Muslim FBI Agent. Um, And I'm sure it's not going to be the last. No, I hope not, because if not, I don't know how the mortgage will get paid. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you are uh, you're, you got a lot of things going, and you're working over here at the Wilmington Star News, but I appreciate you taking the time to sit down for the podcast. Thanks, man. No, I appreciate it. You can find out more about Kevin Maurer's past work at Kevin, M-A-U-R-E-R, dot net. His new book, again, is called American Radical, Inside the World of an Undercover Muslim FBI Agent. Next week here on the podcast, more spy talk. Marty Peterson, she was the first female CIA operative in Moscow. Here's a preview. I would go out at 6.37 at night from my home. I'd go home and change my clothes after work. I would drive uh, for two and a half hours. I'd park my car. I'd get into the subway. I'd go down in the subway. I'd ride several stops all the time looking and listening for surveillance. And then... I would go into the woods, I'd walk there, and put down my package. I'd leave that woods for an hour, 
and then come back an hour later and most of the time he would have picked up my log and left this dead drop there in the same place. That's how it worked. That's next week here on the podcast. If you know someone who you think would be a good interview for an upcoming episode, send me an email, jevans at wect.com. And if you like what you heard in this week's podcast, please leave a rating or a review. And if you do, you could win a cool WECT coffee mug. Here's what you do. Post your review, take a screenshot of it, send me the picture at jevans at wect.com. I'll pick one lucky reviewer or subscriber and send you that cool WECT swag. I'm John Evans. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of One on One.